So I want to thank Michael again for that presentation. It was exactly what we asked him to do. Um, and I think it really set the stage for this panel coming up. Um, um, I'm going to let the panelists introduce them, them, themselves, but um, you know, what we wanted to do was go from the abstract description and case for um, crypto assets, digital assets, and move to the specific of investment strategies and how they can be deployed in this space and what different people are thinking. So um, maybe if we could just uh, go down the panel, we'll start with Ari, and you guys could just introduce yourself, your firm, and what you do, because I think it would help lend perspective to people as to you know, your background and what you're running right now. Sure. Uh, my name is Ari Paul, co-founder of Block Tower Capital. We're a multi-strat crypto investment firm. In my background, I was a trader at Susquehanna International Group and then uh, a portfolio manager at the University of Chicago Endowment. So I have kind of more of the, the Wall Street trading and portfolio management background. Hi, Jordan Clifford, uh, co-founder of Scalar Capital. I'm a managing director there. I'm really responsible for technical due diligence. I'm a software engineer by trade, so I bring that uh, kind of expertise to the field to the play. But we are a long-term focused crypto asset fund, and we're structured as a hedge fund. So we we're investing with kind of a three to five year horizon, broadly broadly diversified within the crypto asset space. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Kyle Samani. I'm a co-founder and managing partner at Multicoin Capital. Uh, we're also a crypto hedge fund. Uh, our kind of tagline is venture capital economics with public market liquidity. We spend most of our time thinking like VCs, making longer term bets, but we use liquidity uh, from these markets to you know, manage um, timing and entry to exit positions and a few other things. Uh, I'm a software engineer by background, started programming when I was very young, studied finance, um, built my first tech company out of college, raised venture, was ultimately acquired, got into crypto, and here I am today. Hi everyone, my name is Ariana Simpson. I run a fund that I started called Autonomous Partners. I invest across the crypto ecosystem in both equities and coins and tokens. Um, I was formerly at Facebook and BitGo, which is on all of your lanyards, um, and have been in the space for about five years, both operating and now investing. Great, all right, well thanks everybody. Um, it's a top-notch panel, you will get uh, some great insights here. Um, you know, I, th I think I want to start, based on some of the questions that I got at the end there, um, I'm going to ask each of you, before we go into sort of a dive into what, what use cases we're interested in investing in, what do you use um, as your kind of rejoinder or answer to those who say, what the hell is this useful for? What, do, what is your kind of quick 25 words or less sort of, this is why this matters to me? You know, maybe each of you could just give you that, that little spin. Sure, right. sure. Um, so I usually hear it from Americans who say the banking system works great, PayPal works great, and uh, I think it's helpful to remind people that for half the world they don't have access to PayPal. They're underbanked, unbanked. Maybe they don't live in a country that has where they're as confident in the rule of law and in their assets in a bank. Um, but what really convinces Wall Street, even of the use case in America, is the fact that every Fortune 500 company offshores some of their wealth, and they pay J.P. Morgan and other banks giant fees to do that, and they do that to be judgment resistant. So if you're Amazon and you have all of your assets in one bank in New York, a New York judge can freeze all of your assets pre-trial, and Amazon would literally shut down because they couldn't make payroll the next day. So if you're Amazon, it's not that you're a criminal, you want your day in court. So you have your assets spread over legal jurisdictions to ensure you can continue operating throughout the, the, that process. And the light bulb goes on for most people on Wall Street and they realize, okay, like, yeah, Apple's not a criminal, Amazon's not a criminal, they just want a little bit of resiliency. And cryptocurrency provides censorship resistance, um, which is, is useful against totalitarian regimes, but also judgment resistance just to keep, um, keep operating. I like it. Jordan. It's a lot more than 25 words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so what, the way, what I really come back to is that this is now an overlay that we can put on the internet, and we can now have economic value transferring between peers uh, over the internet in a trustless way. So really this is going to cut into the intermediaries that are necessary right now to move money and to move value across the world. And with these networks, we can do that in a much more seamless way, peer to peer. Anybody in the world can start collecting payments and start their you know, on entrepreneurship endeavors from their basement now without having to get permission slips from anybody. So it's really exciting, especially outside the US. Um, so the way I like to frame it is, so if you go back to 1980, Larry Ellison was running around saying, everyone really, all you businesses, you all need a database. Um, and everyone kind of thought he was crazy, but as it turns out, every single business on the planet, without exception, is a database with people on top of it. Um, and that's universally true, and you can't find a single exception no matter where you look. Um, and the thing that got me into crypto was actually not Bitcoin, it was Ethereum. 
And the thing that drew me to Ethereum was when I realized that every single financial institution, without exception, is a smart contract with people on top of it. Uh, and I believe that will play out the same way databases have. Ari touched on the point of kind of the outside the US perspective, and that was definitely kind of what got me interested in the space to begin with. So I took a trip around Southern Africa uh, and spent some time in Zimbabwe in the summer of 2013. And this was kind of right after the worst of their hyperinflation, which at its peak had the currency devaluing by 50% on a daily basis. Um, and so I really saw the fact that the economy had been devastated and that they'd switched over to the US dollar to restabilize. Um, and so, you know, when I came back to the US, I was thinking a lot about alternative financial systems and what might be possible in a world in which, in this case, a corrupt central government was not controlling all of the means of value or means of storing or exchanging value. Um, and so, you know, I think from there, obviously, we've, we're starting to see the, the beginnings of uh, a whole host of other use cases, but that was kind of the, the genesis point for me. It was for me as well, actually, as well. And having lived in the developing world, I felt like that's when the light bulb went off. Um, so great, now I've got uh, extra material that I can use when, when people confront me. Thank you very much for that. Good bit of free <laughs> advice. Um, so, um, look, uh, we went through this remarkable year last year. Um, you know, I, I've been covering this for, you know, since about 2013, I don't think I could have predicted uh, the ICO boom um, and this sort of massive proliferation of dApps and, and sort of new concepts and new, new products being built on top of Ethereum, being built on top of, of, of new blockchains, everything else. The explosion of it all is um, really quite remarkable. Uh, but very hard to uh, identify where the real opportunities lie and where they don't. So I'm just also going to go down the line here. I don't, I don't want to make this a, a panel where we just do this one, two, three, four thing. It gets really kind of dull. So you guys should feel keen to interject. But I think just for the start here as well, maybe what are the use cases that, that you're all individually excited about? And maybe we can pick up from that. Sure. So I think a lot of the more it's something we, we generally in the crypto community have been discovering is just how hard it is to write. Um, distributed code that's a massive honeypot with lots of money at stake that, that, and there's no rollback mechanism. So even the simplest smart contracts on Ethereum uh, were buggy, even when people had skin in the game and were losing their own money. And a lot of the really um, fascinating and sexy use cases and world changing require really, really complex smart contracts. And that's just, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but that takes time. And we, people tend to underestimate just how much time. So a great project, for example, a great use case is an Oracle, which is a way of getting information from off a blockchain onto a blockchain. And Augur is a leading project in that, and it needs 95 smart contracts to all interact before you even start having bets and information, just the, the backbone of the system. And that's just immensely, immensely difficult. So I think what I'm excited for kind of near term over the next year is a small subset of use cases that we've been waiting for basically since Bitcoin launched, which is cryptocurrency as an actual usable payment rail to interrupt uh, things like remittances. Um, and the things that are going to facilitate that near term, I think, um, higher throughput, better, it's something as simple as user interfaces. People in crypto didn't care about UIs, and now you're getting Facebook engineers and, and product managers from Square and Circle getting involved. Um, so crypto is kind of digital gold in a payment rail. I think we're finally kind of seeing it bloom. Yeah, so I think that uh, right now what's most exciting is remittances. I think that's a really uh, compelling use case for this, where we have a, a, a digital money that we can now move freely around the world, it doesn't need to you know, do any sort of uh, special, uh, there's no special requirements to move it across the border. So that's, that's really compelling as initial use case. But I think the store of value uh, and the, the currency outside of the US is, is also really exciting. Uh, to Ari's point, the, the longer term stuff of prediction markets and, and insurance contracts and any sort of uh, large transactions that involve intermediaries I think a lot of those are, are going to be disrupted uh, through these networks when we can have two people deciding to make a contract without needing to trust each other, and they can fulfill that contract in a trustless way without giving a slice of the pie to an intermediary. That's, that's something that will, will become a, a much larger, like you go down the road. Okay, Carl? Um, I think I'm most excited for just financial innovation in general. Um, every kind of financial transaction basically has an intermediary, whether you're playing in a casino, whether it's insurance, whether it's settling derivatives contract, um, you can't really name a financial transaction on the planet today that's digital that doesn't have an intermediary in the middle. Uh, and I think the kind of lowest hanging opportunities are uh, getting rid of those in, in all fronts. Um, yeah. One thing I'm really excited about is the concept of private money. 
Um, so, you know, Ari touched on the idea of offshore banking, but um, one thing that I think is really interesting and somewhat controversial um, is the idea of what are known as privacy coins, which are basically um, <coughs> coins which also use kind of uh, some of the same technology uh, at a high level that Bitcoin does, but actually allow you to obfuscate the sender, the receiver, and the balance. And this kind of currency can, can potentially be viewed as something that, you know, could be used for illegitimate use cases or things like that. But I actually think that a better way to think about the realm of privacy coins is really that they enable more selective transparency. Um, so effectively, you're not kind of creating this blanket black hole, which doesn't allow anybody to, to know what's going on. But in, in most of these cases, you can, for example, share a view key with an auditor or somebody like that who needs to verify that a transaction occurred in a particular way. And I think you know a lot of our financial system relies very heavily on the idea of, of having private money. And so being able to have that in a more um, digital, lightweight format, again, without having to trust a certain intermediary um, and have kind of a, the concept of a, a Swiss bank account in your pocket, um, I think is going to be one of the most interesting um, kind of waves that we'll see in the next few years. OK, great. So um, I'm glad you ended on privacy. I mean, we're talking here about Zcash, Monero, these sorts of uh, products that use something called zero-knowledge proofs. It gets rather geeky here, folks. But um, it, you know, it, it really embeds a lot more privacy into what is otherwise a sort of a public system. The idea of a distributed ledger that everyone can look at is almost antithetical to, to privacy, which is so ironic because people think of like Bitcoin as an anonymous currency. In fact, it's very public, right? So it leads me to this other question I want to put to all of you and just jump in as you, as you feel free. Um, we, we talked a little bit about permission versus permissionless. And one of the things that the banking sector um, was driven to, to build things like Corda via R3, was specifically this concern about privacy, right? So whereas people think of privacy and their sort of negative context of Bitcoin as being something that's something that will allow criminals to move money around the world, Really, the biggest sort of concern, at least for the financial sector, is the privacy of their books. You know, being able to enter into transactions with each other and not have to show whether you're long or short, this or that. And, and so Corda was a solution to that, but it was kind of conceived of at the time as a kind of a solution that required the permissioned nodes to work on. Do you guys feel as if there's a place for these sorts of permission solutions at this stage? Um, is there a transition? Uh, it, will they always be around? Is it the only solution? Um, uh, or, or, or will all these other new innovations that keep coming along, whether it's Zcash, Monero, Lightning, these others, solve some of these other problems that, that we face in the world and ultimately make the, the, the possibility of a truly permissionless system work? I think the permission systems have a place right now to kind of teach people the concepts of, hey, you don't necessarily need to own the whole ledger yourself. You can interact with other parties and it can be a communal ledger. And it gets corporations kind of ready for this idea that, hey, a communal source of truth that we can all verify and everybody's on the same page at all times, that's a really powerful idea and allows for self-auditing systems that can be, the audit is the, is the execution of the order. You don't have to wait and conduct the audit later on, reconciling between stacks of paper. You can actually have this source of truth that we all build together. But ultimately, I think the open networks are going to win out. I think that the ability to innovate and the ability for anybody to participate it's, it's kind of like the AOLs and, the, and you know, the other prodigies versus the open internet. The open internet wins because it's just so much more expressive. I think to add a little color to that, so if you go back to the 90s and people talking about intranets were the, the kind of the hot thing and internet was kind of this toy, child's toy thing that was pretty slow and not really usable. There were basically two kind of major um, things levied against the internet, two major uh, criticisms back in the 90s. One was it was too slow, basically performance. Second was privacy. No one said it would be rational to put your private data on a public public wire. Well, it turns out, you know, basic encryption and public private key cryptography solve that problem. And performance is just a function of Moore's law. Um, and like when we look at crypto, and I look at permission chains versus public chains. I have a very high degree of confidence that basically the same paradigm will play out. Today, these things are still a little bit slow. Basically, Moore's law and a few other kind of innovations will solve that problem. Uh, and then on the function of privacy. Uh, there's people working on advanced cryptographic techniques like what Zcash employs and a few others uh, that will allow you to have there just be open compute resources that, that no one will have to verify, keep their own ledger. And as Jordan said, everyone will just have the ledger will audit, you know, audit itself in real time. Well, I mean, but the thing is as well, I mean, I mean, I first started writing about Bitcoin. The assumption was that there would be one cryptocurrency, one sort of monolithic blockchain that would do this. And of course, that was uh, uh, naive. Ethereum then comes along. And now we have this multiplicity of different chains, some of which 
you know, potentially producing assets that are on private chains. Um, do you guys see this cut washing out uh, with sort of interoperability protocols that allow all these chains to kind of knit together and that that becomes our future, our decentralized future, where different versions of blockchains end up working together? Or will some player win out in each space? And I suppose one of the relevant questions there as well is, I think it's useful for the audience to, to understand, what happens to value in those contexts in which, you know, chains can just be forked and there's the potential that, you know, we could just replicate the idea that you have totally scarce Bitcoin, some would argue, is a myth because I can just fork the code and create other ones. In this multi-chain world, how do we, you know, how does it all work in a way that, that, that people's value is assured? This is the trillion dollar question that I think we all think about a lot of how does the competitive strategy play out? Um, it's, you know, it, like I, I have an MBA, which is kind of weird in the crypto space, and I took one competitive strategy class, so I don't claim to be an expert, but just something that you almost never hear people ask in cryptocurrency is what are the competitive forces at play, and, and will there be multiple winners or one, and how should we think about that? Um, and we all think about it, but it, I, to me, it, it's unknown, and it's a weird mix of uh, psychology, technology, so um, you have an economic force in one direction, which is it's going to be, it's almost free to spin up chains, right? So I can fork Bitcoin myself, I can create a permission chain, it's gonna become easier and easier and easier to do that. So there's very low friction to a company saying, we want an internet, we can do it for free and easy. And um, if, the, if the cost of doing that is zero, and if you can very easily connect that to the main chain, kind of why wouldn't people do that? On the other hand, you have really powerful network effects. So people sometimes ask, if I can fork Bitcoin, we have Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, doesn't that increase supply? Um, and the answer is, well, there could be 10 Facebooks, right? Um, and there aren't. And so within a category, you've really powerful economies of scale, network effects, um, such that people tend to aggregate. And so I think it's important to think from that angle. For what use cases uh, are there really powerful network effects and for which ones aren't? And um, here's a really important question that I would ask is, what features force convergence and which don't? So for example, Bitcoin can only have one monetary policy. It can't be both inflationary and deflationary. So if there was a use case where you wanted a very inflationary monetary policy, you would need another chain. Another is governance. A, a protocol has a governance mechanism. It could be a voting mechanism, it could be Bitcoin, which kind of has none, it's governance by exit, but you can't have multiple ones on one chain, or that itself is a, is a meta-governance mechanism. So that would require multiple chains. There aren't that many things that require multiple chains. This is all open source. So Ethereum, for example, can integrate the technology from many other chains, and so can Bitcoin. Um, so most features, features are probably not going to be a um, point of differentiation because features can be stolen and copied for free very easily. They're not really patentable. Um, so there's only a very small subset of things that I think result in high economic value differentiation in large chains. Okay. I, would, I would actually have to disagree that features are so easily copyable. You know, when you actually get down to the protocol layer of these networks, your architecture of your protocol is pretty set in stone. And maybe some communities are more willing to change or adapt it, but by and large, the larger the cryptocurrency gets, the harder it is to change and the harder it is to re-architect the entire structure to meet a new feature. So, for example, privacy is something that Monero and Zcash do very well because they're built from the ground up to do it. And, you know, Monero is very customized for that purpose. It doesn't scale as well, for example, because of this. You actually can never discard uh, at transaction outputs from your database. You have to keep onto them forever because you don't know whether a transaction output is spent or unspent. And that's, that's an artifact of the way the protocol is laid out. So I think that it's possible to build moats around those kind of protocol design decisions within the cryptocurrencies. And you know, some features may be copyable or transferable, but some features are really needing to be wired into the DNA from the beginning. And I think that we'll start to see some currencies and some crypto assets kind of fill certain contexts better and others will fill other contexts better. And I, I don't think that it'll be one wins all. I think it'll be a power law distribution of, you know, these, these, these currencies are really valuable for all these different fields and these other ones are, are valuable for these other fields that are maybe smaller. And we'll start to see, you know, a, a power law distribution of the winners and then we'll start to see bridges that hook up between them uh, with, via lighting networks or via other decentralized exchange type of me mechanisms. Yeah, I would add that, um while it's certainly possible to fork a lot of the protocols, it's very difficult to fork the community and get the community to move over. Um, and I think especially at this stage in which everything is so new and, and you know, things are being built literally as we speak, um, the developer community is absolutely critical in terms of determine, determining which protocols succeed and fail. And so 
while you know, I could fork any one of these protocols and create you know, Ariana's version of it, it would be very difficult for me to actually get all the developers to switch over. Um, and so you know, I, would, I would definitely encourage you all to stick to the main chain and not come over to mine. <laughs> Oh, the Ariana coin could be just a run of I mean, sense. I could probably ICO it for a few billion dollars, <laughs> uh, but you know, we'll, we'll hold off on that for Who a Who needs that chump change when you're doing, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. So um, look, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a dynamic time, but you're all investors, right? You, you've, you've all got a fund here. Um, and uh, therefore you are uh, at the forefront of what I see as an emerging asset class but really, more importantly, sort of an emerging you know, financial ecosystem because the systems of capital formation, the systems of, of, of market dynamics and all the stuff that we sort of take for granted in the traditional financial market are kind of being formed as we speak. And you know, there's talk about whether there's regulation that needs to come in in specific forms. There's also talk about self-regulatory models and the need for uh, you know, different in internal modes of due diligence and vetting and all these things that uh, are, are hopefully going to remove some of the dangers and the wildness from uh, what, what we've seen through you know, this, this early phase of, of crypto. What do you guys, ex how do you expect it to play out and do you think that, um, what do you see as your own role really as well in, in, in helping to forge a more mature industry here? Anyone can jump in. Sure. Um I invest with a very long-term time horizon, so you know I'm I'm not trading. I think what I hope to be able to do is help some of these companies develop. I think what I've seen in the ecosystem um, recently is a lot of brilliant developers who don't necessarily have a lot of business context. Um, and so one thing I think is important is actually um, somebody earlier asked a somewhat skeptical question about you know is this a technology in search of a problem? And I think for a long time um, that was true, particularly a few years back. Um, what I've seen recently is that we're actually seeing a lot of really good uh, developer talent and you know, experts in various industries coming into um, the industry and actually starting to use this technology to solve real problems in their particular industry rather than just searching for a problem. So um, you know, I think helping guide some of these companies and projects to product market fit um, in you know, the same way that any kind of early stage company would need to do is one of the things that you know, I try to do and I think is needed to help the industry mature. Yeah, I think to add a little color to that. Um, so if you go back to like, you know, the best analogy I can think of in terms of recent software is probably operating systems battles of the 80s. Um, and all at the time there was no internet and you know, there weren't many computers and no one really knew how to develop code. And it, it, there's problems with the analogy, but it's the best one we've got of modern kind of software history. Um, but back then there were about 20 operating systems. People don't really remember many of them because it turns out only about two or three survived. Uh, but there were about 20, um, and people were very heads down building code, and there was very few people, I think, at the time whose job it is to keep track of everything going on across all the OSs, figure out what apps are being built on which ones and why they're useful or not useful and what kinds of decisions and trade-offs are being made. Um, and ultimately, there was kind of a right set of answers that, that played out, and you know, Microsoft and Apple and, and Unix to kind of were the only three that really survived in a meaningful sense um, uh, from then. Um, and so I look at my role kind of today is, is um, as Ariana mentioned, um, these teams are all heads down building stuff and they have hypotheses about what set of trade-offs and decisions they should make, some of which are mutually exclusive, some of which are not. Um, and we, I look at it as part of my job is to help them make sense of what is everyone else doing so they can ultimately reduce the cycle times and innovate faster. Yeah, so I see my role as providing clients return. That's the main role I think a fund manager should have. And in doing so, we do our homework. We do deep dives into the technicals of, of the protocols we're investing in. We also look at the potential market use cases for the different assets that those protocols provide to us. And, and also, we invest in some earlier stage stuff where we try to be value add in terms of giving guidance or advice to some of these really early stage teams. And then I think as a side effect of doing our jobs well in terms of doing our homework and making smart allocation decisions, as well as being value add to some of our projects, we help the overall ecosystem become more efficient at allocating capital in, in you know, our small corner. We hope to be doing a good job of allocating capital in the space and, and hopefully that kind of helps generate some ripples and, and the whole space becomes smarter. So, I mean, though, we've all seen and talked about the, the scams, the, the, you know, the, the token issuer that uh, really just the vaporware idea, there's no, there's no code. It's a white paper that sometimes is just copied from, from one other one to another. 
Um, there's, there's, you know, there's not the same checks and balances on the founders. Uh, we don't know whether or not they're just creating multiple uh, accounts, trading back and forth, helping to ramp up the price. There's, there's vesting rules that don't exist. Uh, there's a whole lot of constraints that, in some respects, you could argue favor the, the sort of scammy founder over, over the investors. Um, what do you guys do to protect yourself, and what would you like to see happen in the space to, you know, bring more discipline if that's in fact something? Or do you like being, you know, at this early, you know, early stage where, where there's value to be extracted from some of this wildness and volatility? Yeah, I love it. It's the wild west. So coming from the traditional financial world, where, um, like, I was at the University of Chicago Endowment, where we would say, like, how are we going to hit our six percent return bogey in a low return environment where we had 150 managers who couldn't eke out two percent alpha a year? Because it's hard. It's not those are some of the smartest people in the world, the hardest working, and they can't earn 2% a year of alpha, right? And, and when they claim they are, it's usually because they're using leverage or selling puts or something. Um, and here we have this wild west with crazy mark manipulation, crazy scams. Um, but it, and, and it is a full-time job kind of identifying the scams, but it's not that hard. So you know, I, I strongly advise people to not be dilettantes at investing in ICOs. But on the other hand, it's pretty easy for the people on the podium to kind of identify that a project is, is an outright scam. Um, I'll give you guys a specific example. So a project that I kind of like to poke fun at is called IOTA, which is still, I think, the 11th largest <laughs> cryptocurrency. And we have a family office investor in us that's pretty sophisticated. They spent the last year underwriting cryptocurrency. They can name you 20 coins. And um, they asked uh, what I thought about the coin, which uh, IOTA at the time was the fourth largest cryptocurrency. And she said it's rallying, and it seems really good, and they have all these corporate partnerships. And uh, I mean, there aren't that many people in the world who've heard of IOTA. So she was pretty knowledgeable. And IOTA at the time was rallying because the network did not exist. It was run on one computer called the coordinator that was down. So the network literally was not operable, but it was trading on exchanges, and they were announcing corporate partnerships. So people were going on exchanges, buying the asset, but no one could sell, because no one could transfer IOTA to the asset. The number of people in the world who knew that the IOTA network was down was almost zero. I mean, it was probably a few hundred people. The average IOTA owner, which of course is a trivial number of people, did not know that the IOTA network was down. They were trading it like a ticker symbol in 1999, like a stock. So it's actually, I, I think, I don't want to say nothing's easy, but um, compared to traditional equities, it's remarkably easy to add value as an asset allocator. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think if, if you've been in the space for a while and spend a lot of time reading, um, that helps. Um, I think, honestly, a lot of it comes down to um, who are the founders? Like, w w is the team credible? Like, have these people done good work before? I think. Reference checking is, is probably more uh, important in this industry than almost anywhere else, just because I think, you know, obviously you have an asset class that increases 30x in value in a year. You're going to attract a lot of people, some good and some bad. Um, but to be honest, I, I actually don't find it very difficult to identify which project is a scam and which is not. Um, I do feel bad, however, for, you know, retail folks who come into the space and, um, you know, Perhaps they shouldn't be plowing all of their money into things like BitConnect unless they actually um, have some idea what they're doing. But I think for sophisticated managers, um, it's it's definitely uh, feasible to understand you know what you're doing and not too much of a challenge. I, I think it's yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll concur. It's, it's I don't want to add any barriers for people to, to try things. Um, my, my email address is more or less public information. I receive tons of garbage in there every single day, but I just hit the archive button and you know like it's my job to filter through it. I, I concur with Ari that I think most, um, if you're not doing this full time with a team, you probably shouldn't be investing in illiquid pre-ICO investments. Um, you know, buy Bitcoin, buy Ether, buy Bitcoin Cash, kind of let them ride. Um, to go, I think, any oh, level beyond that, um, you know, you probably want to have people on this full time. So, I mean, we're at, just, we'll get to a question in just a little while, but just, just one, throw one last one here, but I think we'll have time for questions in a, in a moment. Um, the, um, Regulation right, is now front and center. Um, the SEC has given some, some indications that uh, it's looking hard at this space. Um, the uh, Jay Clayton, the, the commissioner, the, the chair of the SEC, has suggested that he has not yet seen an ICO that uh, is not a security, um, although it was pointed out to me that he hadn't at that point when he said that actually looked at many ICOs. <laughs> so who knows what the real messaging is there. Uh, nonetheless, you know, it has the potential to be a big um, break, if you like, a, a source of friction in this marketplace. It also has the potential to, to have international ramifications because there are lots of jurisdictions that are putting up their hand and saying, hey, we're going to be much more friendly to you guys. But I suppose one of the things I really want to get to, and I alluded it to in my, in my presentation, is like I worry that as much as I think 
you know, some level of control over this is important to bring discipline to it, that, it, that the narrative, as much as the actual policy making, is so skewed towards the, uh, the, the, the problem of money being taken away that we're losing the forest for the trees and, and not recognising that these utility, this concept of a utility token, which, in, which has become the counterpoint of the securities argument, right? If, you, if it is a utility token, it functions as a form of payment, as a, as a means of building a network and it has this product quality, then it is not a security and it's, people see it as a transitional thing. I worry that we lose sight of that, right? So I want to see where, where you guys see it going and, and, and how will the, the sector navigate uh, this process? There's a lot of uncertainty around regulation at this stage. What, where are we headed and, and, and what is the strategy for dealing with it? A huge uncertainty and also really interesting reflexivity. So you see different governmental, governments are not monolithic, whether it's the US or China. Um, so in the US, central banks still don't care about Bitcoin. So when, when central bankers go before Congress, they say it's just not big enough yet for us to make us worry about monetary policy. But the SEC cared because it actually started outflanking venture capital fundraising and seed stage, right? It got huge for the SEC, but still small for bankers. Um, so we're seeing, you know, China was one of the first to come down fairly aggressively on Bitcoin because Bitcoin was used more in China and because China has tighter capital controls, so it matters more to them. Um, the IRS doesn't yet care that much about crypto, but with this tax season, you know, if they don't feel they're getting the 10 billion they're owed, suddenly that'll matter. Because now, it's a, you know, two years ago, they maybe it was people that, you know, not paying 10 million in taxes or 100 million. Um, so the bigger crypto gets, the more governments care. You see a strong regulatory response, and it, it's been kind of an ebb and flow cycle that I expect to continue. Um, it's tough. We don't know. A lot depends on various administrations. Things like. Um, What's an example? I mean, if you have bad actors that get caught in a big way, whether it's uh, a terrorist, whether it's a, a huge fraud kind of thing, um, that brings negative media attention. Politicians feel it's necessary to act. So I think there's a lot of like genuine uncertainty, path dependency. Um, to, to give a co kind of coherent point, though, um, I think it's going to be probably two years, and we'll fuddle our way towards an actual no new coherent framework because. To the SEC's credit, they're spending a huge amount of time talking to many, many people in the ecosystem. So every time I talk to like a law firm that deals with crypto or accountants or Coinbase or BitPay, everyone's talking to the SEC um, in constructive ways. So the headlines are when the SEC sends an inquiry to someone, right, or the Attorney General sends this letter to exchange. I don't know if you guys saw, there was a headline that the Attorney General in New York sent a letter to all the exchanges demanding tons of information in two weeks, and some of the exchanges pushed back very aggressively saying, that's outrageous, you're, it's burdensome. Um, so the headlines are when the regulators are unfriendly, but there's a lot of very constructive conversation. The regulators are really, really trying to learn and understand, and uh, I'm optimistic that, it, I think it's gonna take a couple of years, but I'm optimistic we'll end up with a framework that is manageable. Yeah, yeah so I think that you know, all the securities reg regulation and the SEC kind of beating their chest, I think it's probably a good thing in the short term. You know, there's been so many scams, there's money ICOs that do not deserve to exist, and I think that some warning shots needed to be fired. That said, I do kind of worry that we're maybe going a little too far, and, and the whole concept of a DAO, or a distributed autonomous organization, I'm not sure that'll ever fly in the US, given how closely the SEC is watching what people are doing on these crypto asset networks. That may be a concept that only exists in, in the other parts of the world, where they can actually facilitate capital formation by pooling their money into a smart contract that's gonna do some sort of business function on behalf of people. That's a really compelling and exciting way to organize a business structure, but I, it's just, so doesn't, I'm not sure we'll ever get to see that benefit here in the U.S., maybe, maybe a few, few years away. Yeah, I think um, I worry a little bit that if the United States takes um, too hard of a line on this front, uh, it will actually end up doing a disservice to the country overall because I think a lot of the rest of the world is going to take a lot more of a friendly stance. Um, I spent some time in, in Switzerland in January and it's been really amazing to see how forward thinking and friendly they are to um, the idea of crypto projects and things like that. And so somewhere will definitely be more friendly. And so we're already starting to see some projects saying, okay, we're gonna be based out of Malta or other areas. And so, um, you know, I think, I, I hope that the US takes a smart line, and I agree that generally speaking, um, the SEC has been pretty thoughtful and actually slow to issue guidance, which hopefully is a good thing. Um, they didn't come out and you know ban things outright, um, but yeah, you know, ultimately projects will move to areas that are more friendly, and so I think um, hopefully if if the U.S. plays it well, it could be an advantage. But uh, if not, we run the risk of the innovation moving elsewhere. Yeah, I think that's one of the the, the most important points in the in the sense that. Um, 
this is permissionless innovation, um, or at least you know that that's the the construct with which which is the governance of the actual platform works. But you still have this permissioned aspect, if you like, of what regulators can can do and can cannot do to it. But because it's permissionless, it can go anywhere. Um, and you know, if if this space is the realm in which these really innovative new ways to imagine the economy are going to emerge, countries are going to have to um, you know operate in a competitive sense to know that uh, they want to they want to be a, a place where this innovation can thrive. I suppose that's just my last question before we go to uh, the audience here. Then is is um, it is an international technology, or at least a global technology. Where do you see um, the benefits playing out in, in that geographic sense? Is this an opportunity for smaller places to leapfrog? Um, is it, or is it more something that, that resides in, in a more established marketplace where the innovation is going to thrive and the opportunities? I think the earliest big winners are going to be in you know, South America and in Africa, where they don't have access to reliable banking. They don't have access to a reliable fiat currency. And now they can, with their cell phone that they have and with the internet connection, now they can basically be first class citizens of the world with total financial access to, to markets. So I think that the, you know, we're start, that's, that's going to be where it originates. And then slowly but surely, the rest of the world may start to see some benefit on the margins. But I, I think we were all generally pretty happy here in the US with our, with our financial system. You know, outside of 2007, 2008, it's worked pretty well. So I don't think we have enormous like, benefits to, to reap, at least not until we get more sophisticated uh, abilities and functionality on these networks. I think it's somewhat similar to the internet. So a lot of the wealth created by, the internet was really a US phenomenon in the 90s. Um, and a lot of the wealth created in the companies, the giant internet companies are, are largely American. But of course the, the service is hugely valuable around the world, right? So everyone around the world who, who uses email benefits. So I think the people getting, like right now, the people getting rich off cryptocurrency are not poor people in rural India, right? It's, it's people in Silicon Valley who are again getting rich. Um, and I think, I, I don't see that changing. I, I, I kind of wish that wasn't the case, but um, I think that's gonna play out again. But it's still great for the whole world, right? To have better access to communication and unbanking, to have access to those services. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's just open this up to questions. I thought there was a hand up there, but I'm sure if the gentleman has left. But uh, <laughs> anyway, right away. apologies for that. Uh, so, who, who has a question? Up the front here, Michael. Um, let's wait, there's a mic coming here. Can be a tough one. <laughs> and and uh, please uh, announce your uh, well, name and affiliation. The gentleman has I love blockchain on his laptop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so why, why, why do you think it's going to be a tough one? No, I was joking. You okay. have the Bitcoin.com on right. your laptop. <laughs> right. We planted so, him in here, actually, guys. Um, uh, Mitchell Dong with Pythagoras. Um, so it sounds like most of you or all of you are, are long biased or long only and invest in ICOs. And um, I assume that the first quarter has been relatively rough for you in terms of uh, being down. Uh, that's an assumption. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but you all say you're long-term investors, but uh, like a VC fund, but a VC fund doesn't have short-term liquidity. It doesn't have short-term pricing. How do you explain to investors um, that you have this long-term view, but you might be down 50% you know, in a quarter? So how, how, do you, how do you explain that? I would say there's a few things. I mean, part of it, you don't have to be down necessarily, even if you're primarily a long fund in terms of, I mean, part of it's also managing your cash position and things like that. Um, but I would say that generally speaking, you know, you, you want to align incentives and kind of time horizon with your investors from the get-go. So I think setting the context and saying, okay, I'm investing in foundational technology here. We are very much in the early days in the infrastructure phase. So yes, if, if you're not an actively traded fund, you will probably see months or quarters that are down quite a bit. I mean, the last long Bitcoin bear market lasted a couple of years. Um, but, you know, for those who held, it paid off handsomely. So I think, you know, a lot of it just comes down to setting expectations around what the timeline is. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that's a great answer. Um, so uh, the way I describe it to investors is um, you can think of it like an asset class like equity in the sense that there's a lot of ways to kind of skin the cat. So you can be Warren Buffett and find value in exchange listed assets. You can take a VC approach. You can be an arbitrager. You can be an algorithmic market maker. You could be market neutral. Um, so we, we each have different strategies uh, up here. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to win in this market. So it's really just about being kind of upfront and communicating well with your investors about what to expect. So if you've primed your investors to say, you know, we're 
a levered long fund, then they should kind of expect a, a horrible Q1, right? If you pitch yourself as, as market neutral, certainly different expectations. Um, and what, what sort of LPs are coming into your your funds? I mean, people with what level of awareness and expectations? Can, is there a sort of a, a profile that, 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 that fits here? Yeah, so it's mostly, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what everyone else says, but um, VC funds were very early into the space, uh, and then high net worth individuals, particularly on the West Coast, um, I think because they're forward looking when it comes to tech and have a, and are kind of risk seeking, so high risk tolerance. Then we've seen most of the big family offices in the country are into cryptocurrency via funds and directly. Um, it's very much a function of the decision making process. So, for example, I came from the endowment world where at every large endowment, there's a managing director who made more money in cryptocurrency in the last two years than they got paid in the last five. Mm -hmm. um, the CIO of one of the biggest endowments earned 10 years of income in Bitcoin. And, and yet their institutions are not in. Why? Because there's an agency problem. Because they as an individual say, I'm very comfortable. I know it's risky, right? I'll put 3% of my assets or 5% into this risky thing. And, you know, that's how I manage my risk, by sizing the position. Um, at the institutional level, it's, it's kind of cover your butt, right? It's, they're afraid of looking bad, they're afraid of investing in tulips or, pon or, or what could, you know, in what in retrospect might look like a Ponzi scheme. So it's not actually market risk they're afraid of, because they could just size the position at 50 basis points, right? And that's diversified away, it's idiosyncratic risk. Um, so that cycle of first kind of high net worth individuals who are managing their own portfolio, VCs, which have generally a, a very small number of partners, and are used to having zero, like if you're a VC firm, you're used to having a zero. Sometimes you invest in 20 companies, no one's shocked if one or two of them are zeros and, you're, and, and your pitch is we're gonna find a few that are the 30 X's. But if you're a pension or an endowment or uh, just a larger decision-making body, someone has to underwrite that individual investment of their name on it. And even if it's 10 basis points of the pension and it goes to zero, they look like an idiot, at, there's career risk. So I think that's still a year away. The cover your butt problem, right? It's always there. Uh, yes. Can we uh, get a microphone to the gentleman, please? Thanks. Um, do you think it's just this, the agency um, principal type issue, or you think there are other problems which are much more fundamental, like the custody or the regulatory framework or things like this? I mean, we're going to lose our jobs uh, banned from the industry or something, you know, if we do something which is not proper because it's violating existing rules and regulations or things we have signed up when we, we took the job. Uh, so uh, to my understanding, it's more of that issue rather than whether it's a fraud or whether it's a bubble or something, something along these lines. And if that's the case, where are we in that, yeah. uh, how can I say, trajectory? It's a good question. I mean, so custody really is a major concern for institutional investors. So where, where do we head with that? But also, yeah, I mean. Yeah, so, so I, I, absolutely custody is the thing that's gonna open the floodgates, I think. Um, and I think the solutions will be in place this summer, but it'll take some time to get conviction in them. Um, but the reality, at least for the endowments, it is not a regulatory obstacle and it, there's, it's not a violation of fiduciary duty. It's uh, like the answer that I always hear is, is we couldn't get comfortable underwriting. Basically, we don't know how to do diligence on this. We don't know how to underwrite it. And, and the way I thought about it as, as a portfolio manager at UChicago and the way I would have thought we should have underwrite, underwrite it is, yes, there's tremendous regulatory risk on the investment side, not to the endowment, but yes, the fund could get shut down, the portfolio companies could be written down to zero. That is regulatory risk and it's extremely attractive as a source of alpha because it's idiosyncratic. If 10 basis points or 50 basis points of your portfolio are earning high, expe high, high expected return because they're exposed to this idiosyncratic risk, that's the home run for a portfolio manager. Pensions are a little different with the prudent man rule. They have different regulatory burdens, but endowments are totally free to invest in this, both directly and indirectly through funds. It's just, can they get comfortable underwriting things they're not used to underwriting? Uh, just on one more, anyone else want to wait on the custody question? Because there is also services, and, and Ariane used to work at BitGo, who you know, see themselves as a key player in this, the multi-sig solution. Uh, what does custody look like you know, 12 months out for, for people who are you know, at the professional investment level? Right, I mean, I think that there are solutions out there. Um, you know, BitGo plus Kingdom Trust. Kingdom Trust, for example, has been around for quite a while, custodying all kinds of things, um, and they've kind of made a name for themselves in, in custodying digital assets, and they've been partners for a long time with BitGo, which handles kind of the technical implementation. Um, BitGo and Kingdom Trust recently merged, or uh, BitGo bought Kingdom Trust. Um, so that will eventually be kind of the full stack solution. The issue right now is that, um, you know, the each Cryptocurrency is kind of its own beast. So right now there are a number of solutions for, you know, let's say Bitcoin and Ethereum, but as you go down 
the line, um, there's a smaller and smaller number of providers who are technically equipped and who will actually um, custody some of these assets. So yeah, I think you know these, these solutions are coming to market. Coinbase has announced their institutional product that will be launching very shortly. Ledger has an institutional product as well. Um, but you know, there's kind of both the technical question as well as the regulatory piece. And um, overall, I think you know it'll be solved like anything else in the industry. And again, I agree that once once it is solved, that'll allow for a lot more capital to enter the space. Okay, I want to bring another question in here. Let's um, see. Somebody hasn't asked one yet. I, I have a things. question on value of Bitcoin separate from the blockchain itself. So. What is what is the biggest single risk that you see to price? There's discussion, there's discussion about some large, significant holders of coins and various different types of coins that called whales that could be holding large sums of coins that could be that could come into the market that could be a, have a significant dampening effect on price. Um, and I'm, I'm not necessarily focused on that. I'm mostly focused on what what do you think is the biggest risk that exists to price? Um, I, 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 there's just a large number of tail risks that are very large. Donald Trump could tweet tomorrow, Bitcoin is illegal. All right, I mean, you know, who knows, right? Um, Chinese government, Japanese government, South Korean government, who, like, there's a lot, you know, it could be a terrorist attack discovered it's funded by Bitcoin. Governments are gonna go ballistic. So there's a lot of tail risks like that that'll be major, you know, major negatives. Um, the, the, the large seller kind of, that's been floating around the last, call it 30 days, maybe 60 days, that um, just sentiment. Uh, I, I don't think that's as nearly large of a negative impact as people think. Those are typically being done in large block trades, uh, and that's not moving the, the market price in any meaningful way. Um, I can, I'm sure all four of us on stage are, are seeing those, um, those OTC orders come through. Uh, and yeah, I don't think, they're mostly not being done, but if they are being done, they're being done in a way that doesn't really move the price. Uh, just large number of tail risks. Again, none of them take it to zero, but you could see 40%, you know, 48 hour drawdowns. I actually think the biggest risk, um, and I think this is actually pretty low for, for Bitcoin at this point, but for cryptocurrencies is, in general, is um, a really severe technical vulnerability because, um, for example, something like that I think could, could shake um, confidence in a particular protocol. And while in some cases minor bugs and things like that can be patched, um, if if the security issue is severe enough, that could effectively crush confidence in a particular coin, um, and it might never recover from that. In the long term, these, these markets, you see them correlated with metrics like user wallets, number of developers, exchange volume. All these metrics, if you actually look at the underlying metrics, are all going up and to the right. But in the short term, there's a lot more volatility there's, based on media, based on just retail sentiment. Right now, the, the, the market is largely consist of, consists of unsophisticated retail investors, many of them in Asia. So there's, there's a lot of you know, just kind of jittery nerves right now that, that are driving the price in the short term. But I think in the long term, you know, which we take a long term view, we're, we're, we're going to be up and to the right because this is such a fundamental, fundamental breakthrough. To build on that idea uh, very briefly, um, it, it's so tied to, cap, to, to money flows and the ability for new money to flow in. Uh, so I, I, I think the single biggest risk is um, severe regulatory action against exchanges, not because it's cryptocurrency, but for just violating other exchange laws, anti-money laundering laws, not reporting taxes. So for example, um, crypto got hit briefly when a bunch of South Korean exchanges were raided. They weren't raided because they were crypto exchanges, they were raided because they were committing explicit fraud, stealing investor funds. Um, and so the, like the FinCEN, FinCEN sent a letter to US exchanges saying, if you have securities listed, you have to register with us, and if you don't, you'll get shut down. And there's some exchanges that, very, that, that probably have what our securities listed on them. And if they don't comply, they get shut down. And if those are currently the fiat on-ramps, the way that people are accessing cryptocurrency, um, that's very bearish short term, right? And then more professional and regulatory compliant entities will enter the space. Um, but I, I, it's a long list of tail risks that. OK, any other questions back there? There's one there, gentleman back there, the red tie. <clears throat> I just wanted to hear a little bit about the uh, supply side. Um, economics and how that impacts price formation, specifically with like Ethereum, which is, I hear a lot about the development ideas and how there's all this value and uh, how that could be very bullish for all these tokens and everything, but I don't hear a lot about the supply side, things like shortages of NVIDIA cards, things like that, how that could impact the ability of the network to actually support the demand for all these transactions to occur and get rid on the network. And especially if we move from like a proof of work to a proof of stake or something like Golem really takes off where you have distributed um, the ability for 
<clears throat> everyone's an idle computer capacity to basically contribute to this process on a distributed basis for free. So you're talking about the supply side of things like hardware, the hardware, hardware the network, not so much the supply they're, of they're the currency per se. That's correct. Okay, right. Interesting uh, point. Yeah, so um, there's no bottleneck on, on hardware. I mean, adding more video cards or more ASIC mining chips doesn't make these systems go faster or slower. Um, that might impact NVIDIA stock price nominally, but it's not going to impact the performance of the network generally, um, with, again, a couple of very weird tail risk exceptions. Uh, but for the mo general operations, there's, there's no material change. Um, people talk about supply um, inflation schedules for these things is, is somewhat frequent topic of discussion. I think Bitcoin and Ethereum, are, I think Bitcoin's about 4% today. I think Ethereum's like 8 or 10% right now based on current um, projected supply schedules. Both of those are decreasing every single day, uh, kind of rate, of rate of inflation. Uh, I think Zcash is the only major cryptocurrency that has a, a still high rate of inflation. I think it's like on the order of 30% or something uh, today. Besides that, all the, all the other call top 10 are, are pretty low rate of inflation. Um, so the only thing that's changing, uh, people talk about proof of work to proof of stake transition switches. That's coming up for Ethereum soon-ish. Uh, I don't expect a material change in um, overall supply demand dynamics from supply entering the market. Uh, it's a major technical change for the network and it is a large source of risk, but in terms of like inflation schedule, it, it's reducing supply, but it, it's not gonna be enough to materially change the overall price, price action. It is, it is important though to look at where is the supply concentrated and how widely distributed is it. For example, Ripple and Stellar are both crypto assets purportedly that have uh, you know, large holdings within single organizations. So the Ripple Foundation, I think, owns something like 70 or 80 percent of all Ripples in existence. 97 yeah, percent of Ripple is controlled by less than 100 addresses, which is insane. So that's a lot of supply overhang that you really, you know, you want to think twice about allocating into something like that with, with that much supply sitting in one, hand, you know, one set of hands. I think the, one of the interesting messages here is that they, everything's a kind of continuum, and there are different ways to think about how decentralized or other is. In fact, I think it's one of the, the valuable services that I'm starting to see emerge in this space is that there's interesting metrics and analytics that are coming up to actually really gauge decentralization or gauge you know, the, the presence of whether or not there is a, is a third party risk or, or anything else. And so are we decentralized yet? Dot com is a Yes, really that's the one I was thinking of. That's that. great. Yeah. I haven't heard that. And it's got that, whole, that nice little easy to read table Tax and a little right? tick, tick some things yeah. down the side of it. Um, but the, the, just on that note, quickly, because it was a very brief reference to, to, to POW, you know, proof of work versus proof of stake. I mean, how important is this transition? I mean, are we going to have to get off proof of work? Um, do we face, you know, planetary disaster for proof of stake and we must move to something else? I don't think so. So I, I traded electricity, it was one of my first jobs for Swan International Group, actually electricity Fords. Um, so I, I don't know that much about it, but I know a little, and a weird thing about electricity is it, it's, you can't ship it. So you, you can't train, so for example, the East Coast US electricity market is entirely separate from the California. They're totally separate markets. You cannot transfer electricity across the country. Trying to transfer one state to the next, you, you lose a lot. Um, even something like natural gas, you can liquefy it, hugely expensive. We can transfer crude oil. So what that ends up meaning is um, electricity gets produced very close to where it's consumed, which is often very, very inefficient. Bitcoin, for the first time in human history, separated that. So you can now, you mine in Bitcoin where electricity is cheapest. So a lot of the new mining facilities are getting set up in like Kazakhstan, um, places where it's cold, land is cheap, electricity is basically, you know, extremely, extremely cheap and there's no regulatory overhead. So what, what that's done is it's created the first time ever a massive bounty on sourcing the cheapest electricity anywhere in the world, distinct from transferring that electricity. So you don't have to be near an urban center, it doesn't matter what country you're in. And it seems, I don't know if this is physics or if this is just a happy circumstance, that the cheapest electricity when you are able to be anywhere in the world is almost always renewable. So um, there's evidence that Bitcoin itself is actually pushing photovoltaic research forward. Um, so I actually think the bulk of Bitcoin electricity generation in five years will be renewable. And, and that's a pretty defensible statement with data. I, I tend to agree. The only concern is, that is it actually therefore taking those sources away from you know, mainstream users? Well, no, so what I'm saying is that- You're saying it's actually the, the research itself is, is moving yeah, forward, yeah. yeah it's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It, yeah. I would also add that um, the, the environmentalist argument is one that people use, I think, very conveniently to their purposes. Um, and, you know, I, I think mining gold is horrible for the environment. We're literally digging giant holes and dumping earth everywhere. Um, so, you know, uh, printing paper is not terrific. So I think we do a lot of things um, that are not great for the environment. And so, um, you know, ultimately that's, 
that's a consideration, um, but it's definitely not the only one. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of apples to apples or apples to oranges problems. We need. Carl, you want to weigh in? Yeah, it's got, I, so I concur. I think the environment argument is a total red herring, and I think it's total nonsense. Um, I paid no attention to it. I think the, I think the <laughs> other point, Michael, though, you, you brought up. Tell us how you really feel. Uh, <laughs> I, I am known on Twitter for expressing very colorful opinions. Um, uh, the other point you brought up, I think, is, is uh, a lot more interesting and nuanced, and it's this idea of decentralized, and are we decentralized enough, and how, decent how much decentralization is enough. I wrote an essay a month or two ago. Um, it's called Models for Scaling Trustless Computation. It's on our website. It's, it's a little bit technical, but basically kind of dies into this question of this idea of what's called the scalability trilemma. This basically posits that if you have a, an open blockchain system, uh, there's three properties to choose from, and you can choose any two. Uh, and those properties are scalability, decentralization, and safety. Um, safety is not as binary as you might think it is. It, it's very gray. Um, but basically, so Bitcoin and Ethereum occupy one extreme uh, on that, that triangle, which is, and they really optimize for decentralization uh, block production. And they really do so even at the expense of both scalability. Uh, they op optimize for decentralization and safety at the expense of scalability. Um, and you know, Bitcoin was first, went in that direction. And Ethereum was largely modeled after that which is actually interesting because Ethereum has since inception really positioned itself as the world's computer, which implies like scalable stuff and doing lots of cool applications, but they don't have scalability, kind of, kind of hard to do that. Um, since then, there's a lot of teams today bringing um, new solutions to the market that have fundamentally ideologically different views of, of what these systems should be and how they should work. Um, most notably is one called EOS. We actually just published a report about EOS today um, on our website, again, it's free. And they optimize for um, safety and scalability at the expense of decentralization. Um, and so they're making a fundamentally different set of trade-offs. These are just physics problems. You, you can't get around them. Uh, and you know, the, a lot of the Bitcoin and Ethereum maximalists will say EOS is evil and it's a dark side of the force. And I mean, there's lots of that out there, especially in the Ethereum and Bitcoin communities. Um, mm. But uh, these guys are making different sets of trade-offs. Um, Ari kind of alluded to this earlier, but he said, you know, there's like some of these traits that are just, you, you can't have um, black and white. Can, and and I, we've identified about 10 kind of fundamental variables here in these systems that these are just purely ideological decisions. There are no way features to copy. Um, and there will be different, I call this an n-dimensional trade-off space. There's no good way to visualize it in 3D space. Um, but there will be local maxima of value that accrue at different points in this n-dimensional trade-off space. And so uh, a large part of, of what the four of us do um, is kind of figure out like, what are these different ideologies coming to market? Why do their views make sense or not make sense? And will there be kind of uh, local maxima of value that accrue there? Um, but yeah, we're very much exploring the question, are we decentralized enough? OK. I think we have time for just one quick one, preferably a short one. Is there anybody else who has a, it's up the front there. So right up the front, if we can hit this, thank you. Uh, Spish Hermoshevsky from Altus Partners in New Jersey. Um, I'm going to hark back to the Wild West um, uh, again. And uh, in the Wild West, the pioneers got the fame, but actually the guys who made the money were the people who supplied them with horses and spades and shovels and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I guess um, the question is, who will be the winners and maybe who will be the losers um, that follow... Um, you know, the, the winners and losers from, if you like, traditional um, industries who, who follow this, um, this new era. I think the prospectors did pretty well, didn't they? At least some of the earliest, more successful ones. But uh, on top of that, of course, the, the exchanges, the custody providers, the people who are actually building out the software and, and providing expertise on that are going to do well. We're seeing a trend of transition right now. So like an early prospector was Mt. Gox, which, you know, blew up because they really had no idea what they were doing. And, and then, so what's happening right now is you had exchanges like Poloniex that very quickly became a multi-billion dollar exchange in value, uh, or at least it would have been if, if they didn't have regulatory overhead. And they got acquired by Circle, which is backed by Goldman Sachs, because what happened is you had basically amateurs building infrastructure in crypto because no one else wanted to. It wasn't attractive. And then suddenly it became giant, and people were running billion dollar businesses who had no business doing that. I don't mean that as an insult. Those were great entrepreneurs. but. You know, it, it, they were um, not equipped to handle a business of that size. And then those businesses either fail and blow up, or they get acquired, or in small number of cases, professionalize. So using Coinbase as an example, they grew organically and are now kind of professionalizing and bringing in um, more senior people to oversee operations, because now they're at such a scale that it's not you know, a startup. It's, it's now a real business. Um, so I think we're in a transition phase where all of those shovel sellers are professionalizing, and we're seeing Wall Street get in the game. 
Anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, I guess I'll weigh in a little bit. So um, I think a lot of the picks and shovels in crypto um, have basically no barriers to entry or very low barriers to entry. And so although historically the kind of you know sell shovels during a gold rush has been kind of a, a common motto, um, I, I don't. I don't think it's reasonable to project that forward with a high degree of confidence. Um, Coinbase today is facing assault on every front you can imagine, uh, as are basically all other infrastructure providers in the space. It is going to be brutally competitive, and you will see margins compressed very quickly. Um, so I, I would not take that for granted. It's good news for investors, though. <laughs> all right. Why don't we wrap it up there? Thanks for a round of applause for the panel, everybody. Thank you, guys.